Welcome to Pod Save America. I'm John Favreau. I'm the alien Mussolini found. John Lovett. I'm Tommy Vitor. On today's show, Donald Trump's primary opponents wake up to the fact that they're running against a criminal defendant who's still nearly 40 points ahead of him. Sam Alito flips off Congress in the Wall Street Journal. A House Republican screams at some kids. Kevin McCarthy almost comes to blows with Eric Swalwell. Aliens might exist. And later, Tommy talks with Lydia Kiesling about her new novel, Mobility, our very first book from Crooked Reads. But first, we are still waiting for Donald Trump to get indicted over his attempted coup. Any minute now. Maybe by the time you've heard this. I think I even said that before. Um, But... Jack Smith has given us a few more crimes to tide us over. Uh, On Friday, he filed what's known as a superseding indictment in the classified documents case that charges Trump with two additional counts of conspiring to destroy surveillance footage at Mar-a-Lago after it was subpoenaed and one additional count of violating the Espionage Act for illegally retaining the classified war plans that he's on tape talking about with Mark Meadows' biographers. Trump also has a new co-defendant, a Mar-a-Lago property manager named Carlos de Oliveira, who, along with Trump and his valet, Walt Nauda, was charged with trying to delete those security cameras. Altogether, the GOP frontrunner now faces 74 felony counts, with more on the way, which made his entrance music at the Lincoln Dinner in Des Moines this weekend a bit too on the nose. I mean, that's the election right there. It's perfect. Could end up going to prison. <laughs> Could end up being president. That's it. That's what we got. Uh, all right. What did you guys find most notable or damning in the superseding indictment? So a couple things. I hadn't seen. I This came out when we were in New York doing. Mm-hmm. And I'd like seen some, read some news about it, but I hadn't actually seen the document. Mm-hmm. First of all. You're, you were a low information voter who've, who's now become a high information yes, voter. Yes, absolutely. And so first of all, there's incredible. First of all. Jack, again, thank you. Great job. Great writing. Scab. Uh, <laughs> uh, wh- a couple things. One, Trump spoke to Daily Vera for 24 minutes. That is a long conversation. Yeah, to kick off the whole thing. To kick off the whole thing. That's 24 minutes. What were they talking about for 24 long minutes? The person that it wasn't about what, like... The grass isn't like the grass isn't where I need it to be. Uh, the pool isn't good. We got to do a. We got to. We got to. We got to do the gutters. Here's what I can't figure out. How do you think they got that conversation? How do you think they know that it was 24 minutes between Trump and Oliver? Because now, because he's not cooperating. Any cell phone record. You just no, okay. phone so we don't. But we, the contents of the call, we're guessing. Are, you don't know. You just know the know. metadata of like start stop. We just know. Yeah, we have that. And then the other, the other, um, the other thing that really jumps out is the lengths to which Nauda was going to keep his involvement. Oh, yeah. I mean, obviously, idiotically, but like uh, uh, the Shh. the shush emoji, that's mm-hmm. hilarious. But <laughs> one thing that must clearly come from security camera footage is the fact that when uh, Nauda meets with uh, De Oliveira, <laughs> Nauda comes through the bushes. Grabs old Daily Vera part. and says, "Come with me." And they go through the bushes to some adjacent property, talk for a minute, and then Daily Vera comes back. So Nauda didn't want people who worked at Mar-a-Lago to know he was there that day, and so he's scurrying around, but clearly getting caught on the footage that their mandate was apparently to destroy, which yeah. is a little bit confusing. I love that. I that, love coming in and out of the bushes. That's my favorite part too. Doing this sort of cloak and dagger nonsense and getting caught on the security camera footage that you were trying to delete. It's perfect. Well, they're getting caught on the footage they're trying to delete. There's clearly the other side of the text messages have now been given over mm-hmm. to the special counsel So because we have the shush emoji. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no. Yusil Tavares is, is yeah, the, yeah. Is the Mar-a-Lago guy. IT guy. That, he was he was uh, employee number four he's empl- yes. in, so, the, in the indictment. It's since been reported what his name is, and he's now, he's cooperating. Right. So between the first indictment and this, indi- in this indictment, he, he was his lawyer. He had the same lawyer as all these guys. He clearly, this indictment comes out and he's like, oh, no, thank you. He had a target letter. Yeah. And he does not. He's like, I don't want to be a part of this at all. No, he got a target letter from the FBI saying you're a target of this investigation. That's when he clearly started talking because the FBI knew he wasn't being forthcoming about what he knew in some way. Yes. And so then then they switch lawyers. And so then he switches lawyers. And then he's in this document being like, I don't know. I don't think this is right. Which is how, which is which I love. Yeah, I mean, what yeah. he. Tar- which, uh, you, you're usually uh, convinced by a target letter to uh, 
when someone tells you the target you're the target of the investigation to maybe uh, change your mind on something that you might not have said before. Right. And so what he must have provided to the FBI that we've learned in the superseding indictment is the detail of this conversation in the audio closet. Which do you guys know what, what is an audio closet? Does anyone is the podcast studio? Are we in a, I think we're in an audio so closet. Currently where we are. Yeah. So we're all located. So yeah. where you have like some speakers set up. I don't Probably. know. That's where they had this conversation. But like everything about this superseding indictment makes sense to me because from the very beginning, the problem wasn't necessarily the original crime of taking these documents. It was all the moronic ways Trump tried to cover it up. And here we are again, like telling Walt Nauta to go fix it and get the IT guy to delete all this footage and all this cloak and dagger nonsense. Um, it's you know created this open and shut obstruction case. Here's the thing that I also don't understand, which is this is all taking place in June, but uh, the the famous flooding mm. is until October. Yeah, interesting. We yeah. still don't know about the flooding and yeah. the pool, uh, where, how that's involved. We know that it's the. I'm just that, desperate for it to be involved. I know, I know, we all are, but it does seem <laughs> like um, it does seem like uh, Tavares, the IT guy, also gave them the signal chat uh, or multiple signal chats where um, Nauda, Trump's co-defendant valet, asked an employee whether De Oliveira would remain loyal to Trump, and then they have Trump calling De Oliveira again, promising to get him a lawyer, which mm -hmm. this is, this a lot is of the that. move. This a lot is the move. Going on. Get everyone a lawyer, yeah, and then exactly. suddenly when they don't have the lawyer that was paid for by the Trump organization or the Trump super PAC, suddenly uh, they have other things Strategy to say. Strategy changes, yeah. Yeah, this just, just is what happened with Cassidy Hutchinson uh, during the January 6th hearings. That's when she got a new lawyer, and suddenly she was talking more. So this is a uh, this seems to be a pattern. I also think so much was of the focus of this last uh, superseding indictment has been on the um, uh, destroying the security footage, but the charge of willfully retaining the Iran war plans seems pretty open and shut because they clearly now have the document and they have Trump on tape not only talking about the document, but talking about how he's not supposed to have it. And now they have Trump also going out there and lying and saying, oh, uh, it sounds like I, I was just showing them plans. I was showing them building plans the whole time. Like, what you, what or, you yeah. heard on that tape wasn't true. It's like, yeah. well, no, no, they have the fucking document. <laughs> yeah, and they also have uh, Carlos uh, de Oliveira lying about knowledge of the boxes getting sent to Mar-a-Lago in the first place. Mm. And the question now becomes, do, does De Oliveira or Walt Nauta, do they freak out and flip and give testimony? Because they're in even bigger trouble than they were before. Yeah, yeah. The, the, that was the other thing that I took away from this, which is like, like Nauta has been around Trump for a long time. This guy, De Oliveira, he just works at Mar-a-Lago. Yeah, and he just got roped into this. Type. And you read the transcript of the moment where uh, DOJ is now saying that De Oliveira was lying. And he's asked the question, do you, were you, do you ever even, do you, do you even know, like, if you were even there or where that boxes were? And before the question is even done, he's like, no. Like, all this stuff was being moved in. Never saw anything. Never. Never saw nothing. And it just reads like somebody just completely in a situation they had never, no, didn't plan to be in, had way out of depth. You need a little depth. legal guidance before that. Yes. I do not recall would and, have gotten him a, a lot further. Yeah. And he is, and he is having this conversation, and he is it put in this position because he is sharing, he is... His lawyer is the same as Nada's lawyer. He is in the same boat as all these other guys. And it's, I guess, today he uh, he didn't actually uh, make a plea because he didn't have a local lawyer. Mm -hmm. um, but you have to wonder if people in this person's life isn't saying, like, hey, so. man, you got to save yourself. Trump does not give a fuck what happens to you. He's destroying your life. So yeah. if he chose to cooperate or if for some reason Nada chooses to cooperate, undoubtedly it strengthens the case. But I will say... Jack Smith, so far, from what we've seen uh, in these indictments, from what we've heard from him, seems pretty damn thorough. Yeah, it's <laughs> like he case. has he has locked up this case. So if, if De Oliveira decides not to cooperate, if Nader decides not to cooperate, if they decide to say loyal to Trump, like it's still like it, this guy's got a lot of evidence. Only that's just what we've what we've seen so far and read in the indictment. There's a whole bunch of stuff that we probably don't even know. And the other part of this too is there's all these questions around um, Eileen Cannon and how much she's going to be in the tank for Trump, like. Jack Smith is making her life so much harder if what she wants to do yeah. is be friendly to Trump. First of all, you had this this motion where Trump is like, hey, can I look at classified documents in Mar-a-Lago? And they're, they're like, no, you <laughs> fucking idiot. That's what this is all about in the first place. And uh, so it's just like, yeah. you know, let like he, he is being he's not putting he's not putting this Trump judge in a position to be able to help him because this is so fucking embarrassing yeah. and damning. He has to he has to his, his lawyers has to discuss them in yeah. Mar-a-Lago and Bedminster. 
um, like, you know, so maybe not necessarily see the, have the documents there, but discuss the documents in some place that's not a skiff. And again, that is the whole point of why we're here. Yeah, <laughs> it's because Mar-a-Lago was never a skiff, nor was Bedminster. You're also um, reminded in all this, like Trump tries to operate like a mob boss. He doesn't email, he doesn't put things in text message, he only does in-person meetings, but all the morons around him put everything in writing, they talk on the phone, they're yeah. sloppy, they're ham-handed, they crawl through the bushes to have a meeting that's being taped in real time. It's just so Trump, Trump's response to this uh, to the superseding indictment has been to say that actually the tapes weren't deleted, and he never told anyone to delete them. Yeah, you think his lawyers wrote that one. You think that was uh, on advice of counsel? <laughs> the yes. Well, that that's the thing. Like all the 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 evidence that Trump was directly involved is in the conversations that Nauda and De Oliveira had with all these other people, right? There's no actual text from Trump. There's no words from Trump. It all took place in phone calls. I mean, it's all obviously clearly what happened. Yeah. But So his defense is going to be that uh, that uh, Walt Nauda and Carlos De Oliveira and the IT guy, they all just made this shit up. They, they made up the whole thing. They, they cared about me so much. They, yeah. Obviously, I was concerned about these about what was happening, but these they were they just trying to protect me. They didn't delete any surveillance footage, but they thought that maybe they should for some reason. Yeah, <laughs> that's, After, that's, that's his defense. Well, that's the other thing. It's, it goes even further than that, which is in this document, the DOJ sent a draft subpoena. All of this takes place after DOJ. Sent yeah, that's a, why he was charged. But, but 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 that but that like it's you can so, delete your own surveillance footage if you don't get a subpoena for the but, footage. But no, but but like it's you know he gets the draft subpoena and the next day. All of this yeah, is spun no up. Time from a, no, <laughs> no, yeah. no time to waste. Very sloppy. No time to waste. And this the feds ap- are coming. This is apropos of nothing. But whatever. All these, all these, uh, these damning transcripts. So they have the footage of all these guys running around with boxes, trying to figure out how to delete server videos, which they don't know how to do and can't figure out. Uh, and then they go and they talk to DOJ. Uh, they they go and talk to the grand jury, and they're like, "I didn't see anything. I didn't do anything. I didn't see any boxes." And I know this is. Uh, can we just uh, roll the quote from Hogan's Heroes, please? Oh, you went too far. I must report this. It would be worth my life if I do not report this. It's only until tomorrow, and then he's going to take it off again. Uh, After he steals the tank. Oh? From the Panzer Division. Oh? He brings it here into the barracks. Oh, I see nothing. I was not here. I did not even get up this morning. (laughs) Thank you. That was from Hogan's Heroes. 1965. <laughs> Timely topical reference. <laughs> you guys love Hogan's Heroes, right? You, I, know, you I, don't know. Shows, I don't know. I don't know that A little queer coded, no. huh? He's a, little, he's a little gay. He's a little like, I ooh, I know okay. nothing. I see nothing. Well, Nazi coded, was it? Um, yeah, also that. Yeah, no, I think. Uh, I, I did. I saw some of the some of the mag idiots who hadn't got the memo yet on what the talking points were supposed to be. Were like, what? In America, you can't be deleting your own surveillance footage. It's like. No, when the FBI sends you a subpoena for something, if they try to say, hey, we're going to collect your phone, you don't go, ah, and then throw the phone away. <laughs> <laughs> you well, can't do that. <laughs> the thing I don't, under, thing I don't can't quite understand, so clearly there's some effort to delete the footage. DOJ at some point thought they weren't getting all the footage. There's some question of, like, did the footage come from Mar-a-Lago? Did it come from the company? That was providing the surveillance t- technology. We'll I don't. We just. There's more to come. So we're talking about how everyone got lawyered up thanks to Trump. Uh, Washington Post and the New York Times uh, reported over the weekend that Trump's Save America Super PAC, uh, Save America, not to be confused with yeah, we the name of this out podcast. If we can sue them for tough, taking our name because we were first. We were first on that one. Uh, anyway, Save America is hurting for cash because they have already spent forty million dollars on legal fees just this year for Trump and his goons. Uh, I believe they started the year with $18 million cash on hand, Mm -hmm. and then after this first quarter, (laughs) they have reported spending $40 million on legal fees. Um, What do you think about uh, alleged billionaire Donald Trump asking uh, his his mostly working class supporters uh, to pay his legal bills? It's so perfect. They also reportedly spent another $16 million in the previous two years on legal fees. So... That's quite a price tag. I mean, th- this is going to hurt him politically, not just because of the facts of the case, but the the Save America PAC requested that a $60 million donation they made to another super PAC supporting Donald Trump be returned. They're having they're asking for money back. Mm. That's how dire the straits are here. So, you know, they had, I think they raised $100 million after losing the 2020 race. Like you said, they had 18 on hand. Trump is now splitting uh, online contributions. 90% go to his campaign. 10% go to the PAC, i.e. legal fees. I actually, when I saw that, because it, it was actually, it was originally 99 cents were mm-hmm. going to the to the campaign, then one cent. And the, the Times, you know, 
published that they were that the ratio had been switched. And I was like, oh, I wonder what it's going to be. 90 10. That's a lot of restraint for my boy Trump. Yeah. <laughs> I expected it to be worse. I the same thing, to be honest. But still, I mean, I burning think, money. So I think, like, you know, most of his fans don't give a shit that they're giving money to his legal defense fund. They'd probably, like, happily give Donald Trump their firstborn child. Um, but I do think that the strongest argument against Trump has always been to a general electorate and to skeptical Republicans that he's only in this for himself, right? That it's only that Trump does not care about you. He cares about Donald Trump and only Donald Trump. And I think running a whole campaign where you are trying to stay out of prison that's why <laughs> and you are raising money for your own legal defense fund and not <laughs> for nothing else i don't know i don't i think it's a pretty uh, i think it's a pretty good argument for someone to make well chris that's not argument chris christie was making i heard chris christie this. make this, that one but the yeah. rest of them not so much but not so that's much. Well, their yeah. argument, chris we'll you get to it but. you see the uh, the shady shit uh Levitt's guy tim scott's doing in terms of campaign finance what 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 what, what is tim scott up to? Uh, Please tell us. he paid 5.3 million dollars to two shadowy entities as the new york <gasps> times described the newly formed limited liability companies with no online presence, no record of other federal election work that were basically just created for him to pay money out from his campaign to to hide how it's being spent. What do we think he's doing there? What well, I'm sure he has his reasons. His campaign expenditure. <laughs> his I don't reasons. have it. It's just really like truly pushing the boundaries of campaign finance. So uh, like we said, we're still waiting for this, uh, the, the D.C. grand jury to act here. Um, here's what we know. They sat for seven hours on Friday. Mm, sounds uncomfortable. Uh, they reportedly heard from no witnesses. Um, and it was the same day that Trump's team met with the Department of Justice and Jack Smith's team. So all the, the legal analysts, they think that Tuesday is the next meet- Tuesday is the next meeting of the grand jury. So they think all signs are pointing to Tuesday as the day they vote on the indictment because it's not like there was a whole bunch of extra witnesses or evidence or something like that on Friday because they would have seen witnesses going in. And the fact that they had the meeting means it's probably getting pretty close uh we also saw on friday on georgia they were putting up barricades in front of the fulton county courtroom uh and the district attorney there fanny willis said in an interview that they are ready to go uh they have done the work and at the very latest she has promised that indictment or or their decisions would be brought before september 1st and then i think alvin bragg did an interview uh where he said that uh if necessary he would move the hush money case if jack smith really needs to hold his trial on the january 6th stuff before the election what a gentleman alvin bragg although just because my indictment was first doesn't mean my trial has to be first (laughs) thank you although he also said he's not in control of moving the dates the judge would be so sort of like huh yeah Yeah, i don't know how this works again there's just so many how this works is no one has five trials at the same time for different issues nobody so no so what he says is that that what he what bragg said is like it would actually be up to the judge and the judges would have to confirm yeah also in Georgia, there's an August 10th hearing where Trump's team is going to try to disqualify Willis and also t- toss out a bunch of the evidence she collected and remove another Fulton County judge from the case. So I wonder if she's going to let that hearing happen first before laying out her stuff or wait until after. Did you see there was one? Th- there was an attempt to disqualify her, another attempt to disqualify her that was just rejected by a judge today? Yeah, that judge rejected that rejected yeah it's sort of like well we're gonna direct this batch of uh, ridiculous claims about why you can't be tried today and we're gonna do it we're gonna, and you're gonna lose again but not till august 10th <laughs> yeah, it's hard to keep track. Um, yeah. so trump's primary opponents had more to say than usual about his latest felony charges uh ron DeSantis told a reporter that quote if the election becomes a referendum on what document was left by the toilet at mar-a-lago we are not going to win uh, his campaign also hit Trump on the super PAC story, accusing Trump of spending people's money on his own legal fees instead of defeating Joe Biden. Uh, Nikki Haley was on CBS this weekend. She said the party needs to move beyond Trump or else, quote, we will have a general election that's doing nothing but dealing with lawsuits. And here's former Congressman Will Hurd. Forgot he's running for president, didn't you? <laughs> He's running for the Republican nomination. He's uh, barely hit 1% in most polls. Uh, But he went after Trump at that same Iowa dinner over the weekend that we just heard. Let's listen. Donald Trump is running to stay out of prison. And if we elect... I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. Listen, I know the truth. The truth is hard. But if we elect Donald Trump... We are willingly giving Joe Biden four more years in the White House, and America can't handle that. God bless you, and God bless America. 
I mean, except for the last part, everything he said was true. <laughs> Truth was poorly perceived. <laughs> it was poorly received. You hear that one person clapping? Like, yeah, it's a, it, was a, it was a Will Hurd like, staffer. It was, the one, yeah. it was the one Will Hurd staffer. It yeah, just, maybe it, it was his wife. It just kills me watching, like, what a moment you could make out of being booed. There's so many jokes. There's so many things you could do with that. These guys just don't have the, they don't have the stuff. I will say, this is probably more covers than Will Hurd has gotten on any other day combined. Every other day combined, I should say. Except for the so, first day he announced. So I don't yeah. know that this is going to help him win the nomination, but it's certainly getting him covered. I also don't know if it will help him. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, listen, you, like, I don't think you're going to make that argument and people are going to be like, oh, you know what, he's right. But I think over time, if you make it repeatedly over and over again, the doubts creep into these voters' head. And the electability argument is the only thing I think that's going to reach the persuadable voters here. There might, I, they I, might not be in that room, but... I totally agree. I mean, like, good for him for making yeah, it. Yeah, it's a party fundraiser. That's like a hardcore Republican audience. That's like, Yeah, you're not, getting, you're not getting a lot of applause there. Why do you think it took felony counts uh, 73 and 74 and 75, 72 through 74 for these people to finally say something, aside well, from Will Hurt? I, mean, I was surprised by Ron DeSantis suddenly being like, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, uh, he's he's not as electable if we have a criminal defendant as the nominee. Yeah, both both Haley and DeSantis, like the other half of what they said is so cynical and so pathetic and speaks to the hole they've dug for themselves because they both make this point of saying, look, you talk about the chart. I mean, they, they, they both, issued, it was all word salad, but... Both of them make this argument that, like, look, do I think there's prosecutorial overreach? Do I think it's unfair? Sure. But that's the reality we're living in. And despite the fact that Donald Trump doesn't deserve any of what is happening to him, the reality is if these chargers are what people are talking about, that's going to hurt us. So the sin is not overthrowing the government or trying to uh, put in some fake electors or obstruction of justice or deleting footage or whatever it is. It's the sin of putting in a position to not win in November. So they're willing to go that far, but it's in this embarrassingly obsequious way. Yeah. And the, and the reason why is, is, you know, Tommy made the point. It is like that is that is a crowd of sort of the most hardcore Republican activists. But uh, almost every poll of Republican voters, including the one we're about to talk about from The New York Times, shows that like upwards of 70 percent of the Republican electorate doesn't think Donald Trump committed any crimes at all. So, you know, when you say he's running to stay out of prison, most people don't agree with that and they're Republican voters. So let's talk about the uh, the New York Times poll from today. Uh, it weighed in with its first survey of the Republican primary in 2024. Uh, Trump, 54%. DeSantis, 17%. And uh, no one else broke 3%. National poll. Uh, so... We pay attention to the New York Times poll, A plus rated. It is it's basically now up there with uh, Ann Seltzer's uh, Des Moines Register poll is the is the gold standard. Gold standard. Uh, it uh, had a lot of influence on their uh, Democratic primary in 2020, as poor Elizabeth Warren knows. Um, what were you guys' takeaways from the polls? Any uh, specific findings jump out at you? I got a bunch, but you yeah. guys go first. So, so, <laughs> this was fascinating. So, uh, yes, first of all, a terrible poll for anyone not named Trump. There's no really good news anywhere in it for any other candidate. Uh, here's the things that I thought were most interesting. One, uh, uh, 17% said that Trump committed serious federal crimes. But of those 17%, yeah, 22% of those voters still prefer Trump to DeSantis. Uh, voters who are woke focused, right? The, like Presumably a group of people... DeSantis has been trying to gather. It's the whole premise of his campaign and of how he's governed. Break for Trump, 61 to, 30, to 36. So it's a very pro-Trump poll. But this, was, this to me, like above all, was like the most interesting. Above the 43% who had a very favorable opinion of Trump, they vote for Trump 92 to 7. Yeah. So if you have a strong, if you like Trump, you're with Trump. Of the 25% who had a very favorable view of DeSantis, presumably the biggest DeSantis fans out there, the best he's doing, the people he's reached, they split 50-50. Of the 25% that are the most favorable to DeSantis, those are still people breaking 50-50 to for Trump. And that is just, it has to be so demoralizing. That has to be so demoralizing. Yeah, I mean, I think the big picture takeaway is a third of the electorate is the MAGA base. Mm. Another third is persuadable. A quarter of them do not want to vote for Trump, including some who say they will not vote for him in a general election. So, yeah, this is a terrible poll for everyone not named Donald Trump, but there is opportunity there if someone can consolidate the 37% persuadable and 25% never Trump. Now, like the MAGA base, 
not <laughs> this is my favorite stat. Not one of the 319 respondents in the MAGA base section said Trump had committed serious federal crimes. Two percent said he did something wrong in the handling of the classified documents. But in the not open to Trump primary, it is more educated, more affluent, more moderate. So the challenge that all of these never Trump folks or not Trump folks are going to have is that's not a very Iowa electorate. Uh, and so the sequential nature of the nominating process is going to make it hard for them to get momentum early, I think. So the other I'm glad you brought up the like the, the three different um, segments of the electorate, which is basically that was the basis of the piece that Nate Cohn wrote a piece off this as well. And so you've got you've got the 37 percent that are the MAGA diehards. And this is the same as what you were just saying, right? Like the people who are very, be favor very favorable towards Trump. This is not just polling stuff. This is like. We see this in elections. These are like the people who supported him in early 2016. These are the people who were still with him after January 6th. This is his base. Forget about them, right? And then you got the persuadables, what he calls the persuadables, which are the 37%, and then the not open to Trump and the 25%. The challenge for any other candidate, even if, even if you don't have the uh, amazing political skills of Ron DeSantis, is the persuadables and the people who are not open to Trump completely disagree on issues yeah and so funding for ukraine comprehensive uh and support for ukraine in general comprehensive immigration reform six-week abortion ban those two groups of voters are on opposite sides of those so if you want to try to get the persuadables who like trump but are open to someone else and you're a more moderate candidate like a chris christie you're not going to get those people. And and similarly, if you're someone like Ron DeSantis, um, who has taken some of those positions, it's going to be hard to get the never Trumper vote because they don't agree with you. They're not as conservative as you on those positions. Yeah. And even even the group of people that are maybe the most amenable to an alternative college educated Republicans are yeah. still only breaking are still breaking to Trump by 12 points. Well, and in this poll and, and, and Nate and the, the Times does the poll matching the voter file. I looked, they're only 36% of the Republican electorate. That's the problem. So like, even if you consolidated all the college educated Republicans, right. which is hard to do, like you're still, you still have an uphill battle. I do think the electability thing is the only option. This is an actual quote from a voter <laughs> yes. in the New York Times story. <laughs> the best quote. Actual quote. He might say mean things and make all the men cry because all the men are wearing your wife's underpants <laughs> and you can't be a man anymore. Mm -hmm. David Green, 69, a retail manager in Summersworth, New Hampshire, said of Trump, of course he's from New Hampshire. You have gotta be a little sissy and cry about everything. But the end of the day, you want results. Donald Trump's my guy. He proved it on a national level. I don't think anyone has ever wow. articulated why Donald Trump gets so much support better. <laughs> David Green. Well, it just like, it's like David Green from David Green's just think of like something. Summersworth, New Hampshire. The, I didn't even know media, that was a town in New Hampshire. The, me, the media that that person is, that guy's consuming. Oh, absolutely. It's just like, Newsmax. of course these guys can't break through. Of course, you, of course nobody believes the charges. Of course they're having trouble making an argument against Trump. Like all this guy is consuming day in and day out says that Trump is the best and he's being railroaded. Uh, they did some attributes too. Uh, which, which of these attributes better describes Trump, which describes Ron DeSantis? Trump crushing DeSantis on strong leader, 69 to 22. This is what Tommy made this point at the very beginning of this whole primary. Uh, get things done, 67 22, which was like <laughs> DeSantis' whole tough, thing tough. is getting things done in Florida. Electable, 58 28 again. And then the number, the split that matched the actual top line poll result, fun. Yeah. 54% think Trump is fun, 16% uh, DeSantis. And the only thing that Trump loses on is likable slightly to DeSantis, which is sort of funny, and moral a lot. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the likable one more was about confusing. Trump than I think about. I think, you, I think there's a lot of people who think Trump is, who like Trump and want to vote for him, like him, but think he's an asshole. Yeah, they mean you know, he's an they asshole. They think he's a fun he's asshole. He's a fun he's asshole. He's a fun he's asshole. A fun That's asshole. The other, what they're in this for. You know, we've talked about why this, this primary isn't being fought on policy, but this is the point that Times, this is the point that the poll makes. In a head-to-head -head matchup, Trump was ahead of DeSantis among Republicans who accept transgender people as the gender they identify with and among those who don't, among those who want to fight corporations that promise woke ideology and among those who prefer to stay out of business, among those who want to send more military to Ukraine, among those who do not, among those who want to keep Social Security and Medicare benefits, among those who want to take steps to reduce the budget deficit. He just, he is crushing. It's so broad. Yeah, it's not There's, about issues. Well, <laughs> no, but, well, just, he, yes, it's not so about it's issues. Almost, it's almost as if it's a, um, it's a cult of personality. <laughs> you just assume it's it'd be weird. better on all the things. I mean, I, it's just better. It, 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 the one interesting thing, because, you know, we have spent so much time uh, making fun of Ron DeSantis for his horrible campaign, and we'll continue to right after this section. Um, 
But the favorability ratings are still you know, 76% for Trump and 66% for DeSantis. And the way the Times writes it up, you could, it has interviews with voters, other than that fantastic quote that Tommy read, um, where people are like, I-, I like him plenty. I like Ron DeSantis. And next time, he's the one, right? But he's just... Trump's accomplished stuff on a national level. He's only done Florida. He's just not ready yet. So these are people who actually do like Ron DeSantis, but they're just like, no, 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 Trump's our guy. It's the same. Uh, it's just the same trend from like since the very beginning. Uh, DeSantis makes them feel like their needs are met and Trump makes them feel like they have no needs. And it has been the same from the, this entire primary. You mentioned the um, the woke uh, the w- people who think woke is a big deal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there was another question in the poll. Which of these two Republicans would you be more likely to support for president? A candidate who promises to fight corporations that promote woke left ideology or a candidate who says that the government should stay out of deciding what corporations can support. The latter wins 52 to 38. So even when you don't put Trump and DeSantis, just the idea that there is an appetite, even in the Republican Party, for someone who's going to go after corporations because there's woke, like because they're too woke, it doesn't, it's not real. As this guy is announcing another lawsuit against Bud Light or an investigation into Bud Light because their stock went down because people like Ron DeSantis criticized Bud Light for being nice to one transgender but it's person. So, it's it, it, I think that like shows so how so <laughs> online DeSantis is and like for sure. the DeSantis, Ben Sh- like that whole group, like that doesn't actually have the the support for trump on the republican party is not about that yeah and you can also there's a question about woke versus like borders and law and order like it's still the the immigration shit the law and order shit like the that's all the reason that they like trump you know if to the extent that it's about any policies and if there's any connection at all between desantis's inability to have a human interaction with anyone on the campaign trail and this it's that like he's just trying to pander but he doesn't get the people he's trying to pander well enough to make a mark. Like, you know, he did this economic rollout and his he's like, I'm going to fight. I'm going to take a, I'm going to end Joe Biden's war on crypto. He's interviewed about RFK Jr. And he's like, he'd make a great head of this fucking CDC. Like, who is that a pander for? Well, he just who? stepped on a rake so hard. He was like, yeah, I'm going to piss off all these libs by saying I would make RFK Jr. CDC director. And Mike Pence, of all people, like not the most deft politician is like, Immediate press release. Uh, yeah, this guy wants to name a pro-choice uh, individual so to lead the CDC. Like, absolutely hurts himself every time he does, tries to do something. Hi, pundit. Um, well, I mean, speaking of uh, DeSantis' uh, interactions with voters, uh, their, the, the, their new strategy of letting Ron be Ron uh, already seems to be paying dividends. Uh, let's listen. Yeah, it's good to meet you, too. Oh, what is that? An icy? Yeah, that's probably a lot of sugar, huh? <laughs> well, we're, uh, I'm here. I don't know the other one. I'm just kidding. I'm not friends. Okay. All right. All right. It's good. It's good. All right. We'll say hi to everybody. Yeah. The first one was uh, Ron DeSantis trying to tell a little girl to put her uh, put her icy down. <laughs> it's so funny. The, the fun comment is so telling. I mean, for a lot of people, look, we all like despise Donald Trump. But he's a horrible person. He did bad things to the country. But a lot of his voters love watching his rallies. They travel across the country to go to them. It's like a carnival for them. And you can't, I can't imagine anything less enjoyable than watching Ron DeSantis talk about almost literally anything. Or like imagine meeting a, uh, meeting a kid who's, uh, who's got an icy and being like, whew, a lot of sugar on that, You're at huh? a fair. That's where you eat sugar, <laughs> you moron. I got a tunnel you, cake and shut up. I got to tell you, Ron DeSantis is growing on me. <laughs> I, if I see one more interaction of this guy having absolutely no ability to interact with anyone, I, I'm just falling in love. <laughs> Look at this poor fu- this guy, so broken, the hole in his bucket, he's got to fill it with, with politics, he can't make it work, he can't appeal to normal people. What a curse this guy's living. Can I love it. get him a, a one shirt or one jacket or vest that doesn't have his name on it? You yeah. don't have to have your name on all, all your clothing. Are, really are you a camp? Are you, you going to lose something? <laughs> What's happening? He's terrible. Uh, I, yeah. It's really. I mean, I don't have anything else That's to say. I, I just of, we're just we're now at the point where we've done all the Ron DeSantis analysis we can do. We're just playing clips now. There, like, <laughs> there's, not, there's nothing else to do. I, I just I, I love what let the, him cook. The second clip was just somewhat. He was like some woman's. She's, she's got a beer. He's got a beer. She's like, like here you are drinking we beer. Have and a he's beer. like, Haha, I'm drinking beer. <laughs> like, <laughs> it, it really does having fun on the campaign trail. Like you really can feel the difference when mm. a candidate is having fun. Like there were times when Barack Obama hated every minute yeah. of his day. Like the first Didn't year. Want to be there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> for sure the campaign most of his time in new hampshire <laughs> look here's the thing i yeah i want to see a candidate have a go to a pie shop 
have a charming interaction with with some shop owner, say, I'll have an apple and a blueberry, have a huge smile on their face, get in the car, and just throw them in the garbage. That's what I'm looking for. That's what you want in a president. You, you know who seems like he's mostly having a good time when he's campaigning? Joe Biden. I will yes. say that about him. Even your guy Chris Christie, like, you know what? He didn't agree with you on a lot of stuff, but he was like having fun, mixing it up, fighting back, talking shit, you know? Well, he just like, he has a, nor he has this, he's a charismatic, normal person. Yeah, like he Tim just. Tim Scott, Nikki Haley, like they smile. They smile naturally. Ron DeSantis smiles like he stepped on a Lego. He's just like, like it's too big. Grin. It's too big. His laugh is too big. Everything about it. It's just, there's a lot of other stuff. I love it. There's time. Good. He has money, but my God, man. You can't fix that, though. There's that's no, the thing. That's no what, talent. That's, what, that's, why, that's why I like him now. You can't fix that. I will say, um, Echelon Insights finally just did a poll uh, that just came out today doing head-to-head -head matchups with Trump and other candidates besides DeSantis, because so far they've only done... Mm -hmm. It doesn't get any better for any of the other ones. It's like it's like 70-20s Tim Scott, 70-20 Nikki Haley. Now, again, it's all early, but we're not talking... We're not talking, like, 20 points. We're not talking 30 points. We're talking... 50 points. Was that a national poll? Uh, yeah. I mean, the well, name ID is probably like so low for yeah. Tim well, Scott. The, the point Nate Cohn made, I believe, is that we're, it's not early anymore. It's five and a half months. And no candidate that's been up caucuses. by 20 at this point in these polls has lost the nomination, and he's up by more than double. Yeah. And so does that mean this can't change? No, this may, this is a unique primary. We've never had a candidate uh, who's a former president charged with multiple felonies before. Let's see how that shakes out. But right now, man. Yeah. Tough sledding. And you got to be, again, I think... The idea that Donald Trump is vulnerable, politically vulnerable, even within the Republican Party, is one that I buy, but you still have to beat. You can't beat something with nothing. Yes. <laughs> and so far, we have a lot of nothing. And there's a, and there's a, you know, there's a Ron DeSantis in the parking space that's going to have to move. Yeah, well, it's, it's getting close. Pod Save America is brought to you by Beam. Did you know that poor sleep can cause weight gain, mood issues, poor mental health, and lower productivity? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I was sleeping horribly the beginning of this week and then last night i slept well mm -hmm. i feel so much better today yeah I get some it beam makes dream. a huge difference and yeah beam dream is what you want for this it's like a little powder you make some hot cocoa with it basically before bed and boom you're asleep today our listeners get a special discount on beams dream powder their best-selling health hot cocoa for sleep with no added sugar, now available in delicious flavors like sea salt, caramel, cinnamon cocoa, and chocolate peanut butter. Better sleep has never tasted better. Dream contains a powerful all-natural blend of reishi, magnesium, L-theanine, melatonin, nano CBD to help you fall asleep, stay asleep, and wake up refreshed. Yeah, you're not groggy. A recent clinical study revealed Dream helped 93% of users wake up feeling more refreshed and 93% reported that Dream helped them get a more restful night's sleep. Just mix Beam Dream into hot water or milk, stir or froth, and enjoy before bedtime. Work for us. Beam Dream? For yeah. Tastes good, makes you sleep better. That's all you, that, what else what do you need to know? Need? That's it. It could have been a couple words. If you want to try Beam's best-selling Dream Powder, get up to 40% off for a limited time when you go to shopbeam.com slash crooked and use code crooked at checkout. That's shop, B-E-A-M dot com slash crooked and use code crooked for up to 40% off. Pod Save America is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. It's hard to, uh, it's hard to hire. It's not, sure not an easy process. And ZipRecruiter knows that it's tough. But they have figured out solutions for the problems that you're facing with hiring. See for yourself. Right now, you can try them for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash crooked. ZipRecruiter is ready to tackle your recruiting challenges. To reach more of the right people, ZipRecruiter posts your job to 100 plus job sites. If you need to hire ASAP, ZipRecruiter's smart technology finds great matches for your job sooner. If you want first dibs on talent, ZipRecruiter lets you invite the most qualified people to apply to your job. ZipRecruiter's pricing is straightforward, no surprise costs. Team up with a hiring partner who understands what you need. ZipRecruiter. Four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. Just go to this exclusive web address to try ZipRecruiter for free. ZipRecruiter.com slash crooked. Again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash C-R-O-O-K-E-D. ZipRecruiter is the smartest way to hire. Pod Save America is brought to you by Article. Uh, we love Article. We've had so much furniture from Article at the uh, at the Cricket office. Mm -hmm. I, I got think, some outdoor furniture at home from Article. I think our entire conference room is outfitted by Article. It is affordable. It looks great. It's very comfortable. And uh, it usually arrives pretty fast. It sure does. Article believes in delightful design for every home. And thanks to their online-only model, they have some really delightful prices, too. Their curated assortment of mid-century modern, coastal, industrial, Scandi, and boho designs makes furniture shopping simple. Article's team of designers are all about finding the perfect balance between style, quality, and price. 
They're dedicated to thoughtful craftsmanship that stands the test of time and looks good doing it. Article offers fast, affordable shipping across the U.S. and Canada. Plus, they won't leave you waiting around. You pick the delivery time, and they'll send you updates every step of the way. Article's knowledgeable customer care team is there when you need them to make sure your experience is smooth and stress-free. Article's offering our listeners $50 off your first purchase of $100 or more. To claim, visit article.com slash crooked, and the discount will be automatically applied at checkout. That's article.com slash crooked for $50 off your first purchase of $100 or more. All right, let's do a quick roundup of some other headlines. Justice Sam Alito is uh, once again whining in the pages of the Wall Street Journal about how his branch of government should be able to get away with whatever it wants. Uh, In an interview that ran last week, he said, I know this is a controversial view, but I'm willing to say it. No provision in the Constitution gives them the authority to regulate the Supreme Court, period. Uh, He was commenting on recent efforts by Senate Democrats to impose ethics reform on the court. Uh, And of course, one of the authors of the piece that that features the interview with Alito uh, is a lawyer who has business before the court next term. Look, there's <laughs> nothing there is nothing in the Constitution that says a dog can't be Speaker of the House. <laughs> that is the level. That is the level that we're at. These guys literally think they're above the law. I mean, I don't know what happens now. So the Senate Democrats are moving this legislation. It's going to get blocked by Republicans. Uh, there was some talk early, like, maybe there'd be bipartisan ethics reform. Like, uh, that was never going to pass the House. Now it doesn't look like it's going to pass the Senate either. Uh, John Roberts refuses to do anything. So are we, I guess we're just waiting for Alito or Thomas to retire. Yeah, I mean, I think, look, that that core problem with the court is that there's this big conservative majority, and that is not going to change until someone retires. I do think there's a medium-term problem, which is that these guys think they're above the law, and they say things like what Alito said in this, this interview. Um, the takeaway for me from all of the most recent rounds of whining from various Supreme Court justices is they really, really hate scrutiny. They hate media scrutiny. They're offended by ProPublica's existence. And I hope that shames legacy outlets into doing a little less access journalism and a little more digging into these people because uh, they are far too comfortable in these like big donor right wing ideological circles with Leonard Leo and the Federalist Society. And it is, I think, changing the way they vote on stuff. And it would be helpful to have some sort of ethics reform. It is remarkable even how far Alito, who's always been one of, if not the most right wing judge, has how far he's come in terms of his willingness to just sort of defy defy tradition and speak publicly in his confirmation hearing is very clear you know judges shouldn't be coming out there and you know basically just sort of uh, uh improving about issues that could come before the court he's out there not only is he saying that he thinks the supreme court can't be regulated by congress he's asked do the other justices agree he says i don't know that there are, that any of my colleagues have spoken about it publicly so i don't think i should say but i think it is something we have all thought about and as uh, our friends at Strict Scrutiny pointed out this is basically like kind of like some version of an advisory opinion saying if you pass a law like this, we'll, we'll, we'll overturn it. Uh, Strict Scrutiny did a great job on yeah. this uh, on, on this week's episode, it. so go check it out. No, I mean, it, it, here's, what, here's what we can do. Uh, go donate some money and help out uh, Sherrod Brown and John Tester and some of these uh, really close Senate races and then flip the House. Then, you know, in that sense, we can maybe get some ethics reform. And but the Senate's even more important because one of these guys retires. We're going to need a Democratic president and Democratic Senate to uh, get a new justice in there or else uh, we're going to get more of this. Um, (laughs) Here's here's a story we can do something about. Uh, Punchbowl News reported last week that Republican Congressman Derek Van Orden was giving a tour of the Capitol when he came across a group of. Teenage Senate pages. These are uh, these are a type of interns for people who don't know. They help out in the Capitol. They're around 17 years old, uh, and they were lying on the ground in the Capitol rotunda taking photos, which a lot of people do. Which a lot of people do. And here is what the congressman said to them: "Wake the fuck up, you little shits! What the fuck are you all doing? Get the fuck out of here! You are defiling the spaces, you piece of shit! I don't give a fuck who you are. I'm a congressman." Uh, Van Orden was at the Stop the Steal rally on January 6th uh, and represents a very flippable district in Wisconsin. Uh, We should probably replace him with someone else, huh? Yeah, that'd be good. He was apparently drinking in his office before this. And also, he's a former Navy SEAL. So this isn't some, like, you know, bookish nerd screaming in the faces of a 16-year-old that they're a little shit and they're defiling the Capitol. It's a big, intimidating veteran who also yelled at a bunch of librarians back in the day because he was very mad about a pride flag. In uh, in a at a library somewhere in Wisconsin. I think we need more people to yell at teens. <laughs> Do you think they're just getting too big for their bridges? Yeah, you get, you, you get a bunch of teens. 
I, he does get points for novel um, defense of himself. He said something about how the Capitol Rotunda was once a field hospital during the Civil War. Yeah, what was that? Get out of here. This was once a field hospital during the Civil War. Anyway, you can't take pictures. Anyway, we heard about this story. We, uh, of course, reached out to Ben Wickler, <laughs> chair of the Wisconsin Democratic Party, and we put together a, uh, a link uh, that you can donate to uh, Van Orden's eventual opponent because we don't have a, a, a Democratic nominee yet for that seat, but uh, we will eventually. So uh, we'll tweet out again uh, from all of our accounts if you want to give. I just have to say, so this got like bipartisan condemnation. It's one of those rare things. All that of goes, the Senate. Yeah. Except, except, did you see what Kevin McCarthy said? Yeah. <laughs> Kevin McCarthy said this. Uh, it wasn't. First of all, he said it wasn't the norm for that congressman, which, as is, is Tommy just suggested, is not true. Think about was. all. Uh, the, think about all the times he gets drunk and doesn't yell at teens. Well, then he said this. I guess the interns have some ritual of laying down or something like that. I think it's a misunderstanding of all sides. This is what happens when you need literally every vote to stay speaker. I love it. You defend everything. He is just pathetic. We we have well we have more to say about Kevin McCarthy. Um, <laughs> The Daily Beast has a story that about a month ago, while Republicans were voting to censure Adam Schiff, California Democrat Eric Swalwell yelled, you're weak, at Kevin McCarthy. The next day, Swalwell was on his way to the bathroom when McCarthy got in his face and said, quote, call me a pussy again and I'll kick your ass. To which Swalwell responded, you are a pussy. <laughs> that, cadence is, that cadence is documented in the Daily Beast. The, to which McCarthy responded, by walking away. <laughs> um, this story is sourced to two House members who declined to give their names. Do you guys think one of them was Eric Swalwell? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, I, I love it. I, I, I love the whole thing. I like that. I like that also. We're just sort of like, there's just that part of us that's like, haha, Kevin McCarthy didn't physically fight Eric Swalwell, therefore he sucks. <laughs> well, it is funny though, like he goes, you're weak, and then he comes up to me and he's like, don't call me a pussy. <laughs> So weird. I also like that this didn't just happen on an average Thursday when they're voting on like renaming a post office. This was right before the prime minister of India addressed a joint session of Congress. So these guys almost threw down before like the eyes of the world were on the U.S. Congress. My only take on this is I think more members of Congress should just fight. Well, I, this, we didn't even I don't work even it know out. If, have we talked about the Marjorie, the ongoing Marjorie Taylor Greene, Lauren Boebert, will they, won't they fight each other? There's been like multiple accounts, I think many of them from the Daily Beast, of those two on the floor almost getting into blows as yeah, well. Or they're, they're in the bathroom, they're on the floor. Look, here's the thing. Everyone needs to come. Everyone needs to. They should go on. Get get them on vacation. Get them get them out of that place. The for slow the, the slow erosion of like every civic virtue in this society like has been just really frustrating and hard to experience. <laughs> but if it does result in physical confrontations between the Speaker of the House and a Democrat, or between Lauren Boebert and Marjorie Taylor Greene, See, I don't know. Okay. See, I, I'm I'm not with you there. I think this isn't an erosion. I think this is a throwback to the old school ways of uh -huh. doing stuff in Congress when we used to cane each other and do other things. Also, like Swallow is a pretty big guy. I think he played soccer at, in Maryland. Um, so I don't know. I like our odds here. Yeah, I do too. <laughs> I think we should bring back the canings. I, I want to see Kevin this McCarthy's toxic, hold me back guy. Is it like a is, Chip Roy? It's toxic masculinity all over the place. Absolutely. That's what this We're is. Coded in toxic I, masculinity. I told the story about about the the Eric Swalwell thing in New York. And this, like, you know, this progressive audience, they were like, he called him a pussy and he didn't fight. They freaked out. They loved it so much. <laughs> we're, all, we're all just a bunch, of, we're all a bunch of apes running around wearing suits. Uh, <sighs> the other Republican leader on the Hill uh, has had a tough week. Uh, Mitch McConnell was in the middle of giving a statement at a press conference when he froze up and apparently lost the ability to speak. It's a pretty scary thing to watch. Uh, McConnell was hospitalized back in March for a bad fall that kept him out of the Senate for six weeks and reportedly has had another fall since then. Uh, of course, President Biden called him immediately after the press conference to see how he was doing. Uh, and here's what Donald Trump said to Breitbart about the episode. That was a sad thing to see. He had a bad fall, I guess, and probably an after effect of that. But it was also sad that he gave trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars to the Democrats to waste on the Green New Deal, destroying our oceans and destroying our great beautiful vistas and plains all over our country with windmills that are very expensive energy. So that's a very sad thing also. At the same time, I hope he's well. <laughs> <laughs> honestly, honestly for him, not bad. 
<laughs> mostly, mostly okay. Just like, we got into windmills? How did we get he that? He hates was, the windmills. He does hate the windmills. He really hates so, the windmills. You get from like, what do you think of Mitch McConnell's episode to windmills? Mitch McConnell didn't give the Democrats any money for that. He didn't support the IRA. <laughs> it wasn't the Green New Deal. He's, I think he was referencing the IRA. Mitch McConnell tried to stop that. He didn't. It was a yeah, bunch of reconciliation thing. It's very what confusing. Is, it's very... I, yeah, I think it was John Oliver who several years ago did a piece where they had uh, some other third party, just a random person, do a reading, not dramatic or otherwise, just a reading of a, a section of the Trump speech. And it is just incoherent gibberish, top to bottom. And I think this is a great example. In that Breitbart uh, interview, he also, Trump was bragging about his endorsements, and this I enjoyed. He said, Ron DeSantis is one. Take a look at Ron DeSantis. He had no choice until I endorsed him. He wouldn't be, he could be right now at a law firm or working at a pizza place. <laughs> so that was his take. <laughs> I do not think he has the personality to be in a customer service position. No, no, right. no he cannot. Yeah, no, he cannot interface back. with the customer. Maybe he could be in the back of the he kitchen. The pies, no, maybe. he can't. He does not, he he does not, be, not he have that be delivering those touch. pizzas. He's trying to. He's basically trying to deliver pizzas now without the pizzas. <laughs> not going doors. It's not going well. It's not going well. No one wants it. No one wants your pizza. Maybe he there. should bring some pizzas. Um, start. All right. Finally, in case you missed it, Air Force Major David Grush, 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 made some explosive claims at a congressional hearing last week about UFOs, or uh, if you're if you're real smart, UAPs. That's Why what they're called these UAPs? days. I don't know. I What's wrong this. with you? Unidentified Un- flying objects was good. It wasn't broken. Why are we fixing it? UAP UAPs. is unidentified aerial phenomena. All right. I know. That's if you're, uh, yeah, you think yeah. you're great. Here's a clip of uh, uh, his exchange with Congresswoman Nancy Mace. You say that the government is in possession of potentially non-human spacecraft. Based on your experience and extensive conversations with experts, do you believe our government has made contact with intelligent extraterrestrials? Something I can't discuss in public setting. Um, okay, I can't ask when you think this occurred. <laughs> um, if you believe we have crashed craft, uh, stated earlier, do we have the bodies of the pilots who piloted this craft? As I've stated publicly already in my News Nation interview, uh, biologics came with some of these recoveries. Yeah. Um, were they, I guess, human or non-human biologics? Non-human, and that was the assessment of people uh, with direct knowledge on the program I talked to that are currently still on the program. And was this documentary evidence, this video, photos, eyewitness? Like, how would that be determined? The specific documentation I would have to talk to you in a skiff about. Gotcha. Non-human biologics. What do you guys think? I just, oh, that I want this to be good and true. Uh, he's the, the the kookiness, the kookiness of this guy, who's also claimed that uh, Mussolini found an alien craft, and through uh, uh, the Pope, contacted the U.S. government to be part of the original cover-up. There's Checks not, out. there's no evidence. Um, he doesn't have any evidence to provide. Uh, apparently, he did go to the U.S. He, he was cleared to say these things. In other words, that they're not secrets. So he's not divulging any government secrets. Um, I, I just, I think this is a lot of people having fun in a hearing and nobody being the adult who's going to say, none of them, like, the, no one's willing to say, like, this is, this isn't it. Yeah, I think even the people chairing the hearing were like, welcome to the most popular subcommittee hearing in history. Like, they're just in on the phone and the press coverage. Also, wait and uh, name drop the News Nation there. Yeah. Sorry, pal. Because I said in my uh, oh, News Nation interview. Which you apparently you talk to Chris Cuomo? <laughs> Don't want you to repeat yourself there. I'm, I guess you were too busy having premarital sex, Nancy Mace. <laughs> <laughs> to watch my phenomenal News Nation interview. Oh we might have to offer some context there in a second. <laughs> oh, yeah. No. So, so hey, sorry. So she said at a prayer breakfast that she uh, couldn't fuck because she had to go to the prayer breakfast. And then she got in some trouble for that. And then she said she was kidding. And the Republicans were like, we don't like when women joke about sex. We like what Tim Scott does. Nothing. So Nothing. <laughs> He's a Ken doll down there. And that's what we want. Anyway, aliens. So, aliens. So, too much? I mean, no. I think it's no, just, right. just enough. I'm open to aliens existing. Like, I believe these two Navy pilots who are at the hearing and said they keep seeing weird stuff that accelerate in ways they can't explain. Like, I, they have no reason to lie. But this guy, uh, he also said that the program is above congressional oversight and paid for by misappropriation of funds. Again, that would create some sort of paper trail that I feel like someone could find. He says he knows of people who have been harmed or injured by efforts to cover up what happened, maybe even killed. Those people would have families. Uh, I like, I, I I think the government is really bad at keeping secrets and holding together conspiracies. That's why they don't often happen. There's there's one guy who was pretty high up in the government 
who is famously bad at keeping secrets or handling classified information. Yes. <laughs> and if there was something out there, we would have heard it from him. Or Barack he would, Obama. <laughs> it is Barack Obama. <laughs> or Donald Trump would have told someone else, or he would have leaked it somewhere. The other thing is this guy, this guy basically admits he has no firsthand knowledge right. told of these purported programs. He hasn't seen any craft, or he hasn't, se- he hasn't seen any uh, alien dead pilots. Uh, he said he's repeating what other people have told him, so it's hearsay. And, you know, he has approached, along with others, the New York Times, the Post, the Politico, were all offered the story. None of them uh, wanted to run it because they ran it down and they didn't find it as credible enough to run. Yeah, and there's been, I think, questions, too, in the years since the Times ran that story about the the provenance of that Times story that was, like, the first big story in the I think time. they feel burned. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think Dean Bickey was like, oh, cool. Uh, but <laughs> sounds uh, neat. Yeah, like I, I, I agree. Like, like yes, there have been kind of unexplainable videos that actual pilots and actual members of the military have seen. They can't explain them. The leap then to there's a government bunker with um, uh, alien ships. I also believe is plausible. He uh, he said we've likely been aware of non-human activity since the 1930s. So again, it's just a very long time to keep a secret through various administrations. Lots of people that would have knowledge of this, unless it was so secret that whatever they were working on or studying was kept away from all uh, presidents and political hires or anybody that would yeah. touch this stuff. I just I find it a little hard to believe. I'm just waiting for a, an RFK Jr. policy speech about this. He seems like he'd, he'd be right in on this. Mm, that's a good RFK call. Jr., Elon Musk, I think the all-in guys. There's, there's like a nexus of people that I could totally see. Yeah, there's there's also hiding jumping on. Yeah, maybe. oh yeah. <laughs> hiding it with Bitcoin. Fuck. There's, also, uh, there's also just such a... Um, like a uh, uh, um, like human centric view of all of this. There's such a like um, what's the word like chauvinism about being a person that like the assumption is that like oh there must be a craft with a pilot. What? Oh, because that's how we do it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just and and the fact that all of the like if you look at the map of reports of of UFOs, they're very heavily con- concentrated in the English speaking world hmm. because thinking that there are UFOs is a very uh, big phenomenon in English-speaking countries. Yeah, and we also recently learned that the Chinese have been flying gigantic spy balloons over our country at 60,000 feet. Like, there's lots of weird stuff going on up there. There's lots of weather balloons. There's lots of unexplained phenomenon. There's lots of weird new weather patterns. Like, who knows? So, Tommy, can you tell us? I I wish I did. Uh, Your wife asks me uh, every time she drinks. (laughs) Is that what she asks you? And and I was going to say, and unfortunately, times when she doesn't drink also. I'm like, listen, I wish I knew about the moon landing, but uh, no one would have told me for obvious reasons. Anyway, no aliens. Well, as far as we know, as far as we know, as far as we know. Hold on a second. It's a big universe out there. Uh, at least this hearing has not proved. This hearing did not prove that there are any. Proves that this guy wants to write up, wants to, wants to make some, um, yeah, some well, cash money. Which, and way. I support that because it's America and George Sanders is in Congress and, and you get yours. Okay, before we get to the interview, two quick housekeeping notes. On Tuesday, August 8th, abortion rights are on the ballot in Ohio. Uh, there will be a ballot measure in that state this November to pass a constitutional amendment guaranteeing abortion access. But since the Republicans who control the state legislature do not want that to happen, they created another ballot measure for August 8th that would raise the threshold for passing constitutional amendments from a simple majority to 60%. So if you want to help stop that measure from passing in a few weeks, we have volunteer opportunities to help get out the vote all week. Head to votesaveamerica.com slash Ohio to learn more. Last but not least, Lydia Kiesling's Mobility, the first novel from Crooked Reads, is finally out. You can get your copy at cricket.com slash mobility or wherever books are sold. Here's some advanced praise, a beautifully written and stunningly smart novel, a cautionary tale for our times. Tommy, you had a great conversation with Lydia at an event here in L.A. on Thursday that we're about to hear a portion of. What should people know about Lydia in this book? First of all, I love Lydia. We did this event last week, uh, Dynasty Typewriter, the house that John Lovett built. It was in my time slot. Um, <laughs> a bunch of folks came out. Uh, we talked about the book, about writing in general. It's it's a it's fiction. It's a novel. It's a really fun novel that follows uh, the main character, Bunny, from her time as a teenager, as a foreign service brat in Azerbaijan, to her adulthood uh, working in the energy build- industry. And, um, you know, it's a human story, but it's also about sort of the lies we tell ourselves when we know we're not doing something that is right, uh, the, the sprawling nature of the energy business. And I don't know, it's just really great. She's incredibly smart. Um, and I think you'll all love it. Where, uh, where do they come down on windmills? Uh, I think they're pro windmills. <laughs> just want to make sure. Right, but I'll good. double check with, with Lydia. 
Um, anyway, you are all after the break about to hear a portion of the conversation between Tommy and Lydia. Everyone go by mobility, uh, crooked.com slash mobility or wherever books are sold. Check it out now. When we come back, Lydia Kiesling. Pod Save America is brought to you by Rocket Money. A staggering 80% of people have fallen victim to the sneaky clutches of forgotten subscriptions. <laughs> Very uh Yeah, ominous. we're really taking it to the next level here. That's your hard-earned money draining into the subscription abyss. But fear not. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps you lower your bills all in one place. Fear not what Rocket Money can do for you, John. Oh, no. <laughs> Rocket Money will quickly and easily... Find your subscriptions for you. And for any you don't want to pay for anymore, just hit cancel. And Rocket Money will cancel it for you. Subscriptions, people, they'll cancel anything you want. Yeah, cancel anyone. Someone you saw on Joe Rogan, canceled. Rocket Money also helps you manage all your finances in one place and automatically categorize your expenses so you can easily track your budget in real time and also get alerted if anything looks off. Over 3 million people have used Rocket Money, saving the average person up to $720 per year. Stop throwing away your money, cancel unwanted subscriptions, and manage your expenses the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash crooked. That's rocketmoney.com slash crooked. Pod Save America is brought to you by Policy Genius. I'm sitting right here. Yeah, you're right. Wow. We've never made that joke. I don't know why. I can't believe it. Because it's insufferable Six sounding. years? Yeah. Because <laughs> everyone hates me now. <laughs> anyway, it's important to get life insurance in case your uh, your business partner kills you off. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> if you have a family, you know how much your loved ones depend on you. In a worst case scenario, you wouldn't want them to worry about money. A good life insurance plan can give you peace of mind that if something happens to you, your family will have a safety net to cover mortgage payments, college costs, or other expenses so they can get back on their feet and focus on what's most important. Policy Genius knows how valuable your time is. Their technology makes it easy to compare life insurance quotes from America's top insurers in just a few clicks. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just 25 bucks per month for a million dollars of coverage. Some options offer coverage in as little as a week and avoid unnecessary medical exams. Your loved ones deserve a financial safety net. You deserve a smarter way to find and buy it. Head to policygenius.com to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save. That's policygenius.com. Pod Save America is brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace is the all-in-one platform for building your brand and growing your business online. Stand out with a beautiful website, engage with your audience, and sell anything, your product, the content you create, even your time. Get started with the best-in-class website template and customize it to fit your needs. Browse the category of your business to find a perfect starting place. Sell your products on an online store. In an online store? Sure. Oh, yeah. Whether you sell physical or digital products, Squarespace has the tools you need to start selling online. Uh, what summer product do you think would be a good thing to sell right now? Uh, acid to burn off your fingerprints if you left something behind uh, after a At tour. the old... Yeah, White House. Yeah, putting the white in the house, you know? Yep. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and you'll stand out in any inbox with Squarespace email campaigns. Collect email subscribers and convert them into loyal customers. Start with an email template and customize it by applying your brand ingredients like site colors and logo. Built-in analytics measure the impact of every send. Go to squarespace.com slash cricket for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use offer code cricket to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thank you so much, Tommy. Um, and thank you to Zando and Crooked Media um, who have worked so, so hard on this. Um, and yeah, I'm just so happy to be here. And thanks to all of you for coming out and to uh, Dynasty Typewriter. The book is deeply researched, Bunny's deeply researched at this point, um, both the industry, but also the scenes feel so real. And, and you were telling me that you did some pseudo detective work to kind of make those scenes come to life. Can you tell us a bit about that, that process? Yes. So I, um, you know, a lot of the book was written, I, I wrote part of the book before COVID started. Um, and then it kind of ground to a halt, uh, when the pandemic began and then I went back to it, but obviously, you know, there was no like going anywhere during those time periods for research. And also, you know, when you're writing a novel, you have no idea whether anyone will ever like pay you money for it usually. So I couldn't really justify like an expenditure, you know, of going to like travel. Um, so I sort of said I had to try and sell it and then I would go and kind of see some things in person and the timing worked such that right after I sold it, um, I got, a I, I subscribed to like all these horrible <laughs> email lists from the oil and gas industry. And I saw that there was going to be a, a luncheon to honor, um, 
women in energy in Houston, you know, the next month. So, and you could buy a ticket as a member of the press. So I went to that. Um, and I feel, I feel kind of bad because I was sitting at a table with like one of the honorees and, and I was like, oh, the, wow. I was, the, I, they, they put the honorees like at all the tables and I was the press and they're like, so what, what do you write for? And like, I've written for, you know, some big outlets. So I was like, you know, like the New York times, <laughs> I didn't misrepresent myself that I, I just didn't, I didn't say more. Um, but you know, so like some impressions may have been left, um, and I, and I just kind of listened and it was really fascinating because first of all, like apparently some like sexist thing had happened like the night before with among like the organizers. And so like the people at the table were talking about this and I was like, wow, even the fucking women in energy, like awards luncheon are still subjected to this. Um, and yeah, there was like a keynote by, um, someone who had been in the FBI and there was just a lot, like it was and it was sponsored by like Deloitte and Schlumberger and like all the big oil and gas companies. And yeah, that was like my first subterfuge. Oh, I also told the um, Petroleum Club of Houston that I was interested in holding my wedding there. Yes. So. <laughs> <laughs> How'd that go? I was like, I'm, I'm only in town for this one day like to see my dream <laughs> wedding venue. <laughs> and I mean, it was, it was kind of like, once I got up there, I was like, I could have just asked to see sure, it just yeah. because I wanted to, but it was way more fun to be like, my reception is going to be amazing in the Aramco room um, <laughs> with the view of the city. I mean, it is a, you know, it's got amazing views. Um, so yeah, there's a little, a little, a little subterfuge, some light. And then I just drove through like a lot of kind of refinery infrastructure. Like I wasn't going to really try and sneak into like no. the works, but, um, but offshore rig. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just like go out in a canoe. Um, no, it didn't, it didn't extend that far. That's so funny. You said it was your wedding. They like they're like having you do a cake tasting in the back. You're like, I'm just gonna take you guys down. For being honest, um, the other parts of the book that felt so real to me were when Bunny's in Baku. Um, she's living at the embassy. Uh, you you nailed the like kind of shitty intergovernmental relationships between the State Department people and the CIA staffers who all kind of don't like each other but have to coexist. Uh, and then I learned you grew up in a foreign service family. And so this is something you sort of witnessed yourself over the years? Um, yeah, I, I did grow up in the foreign service. Um, we were not posted to Baku, but um, we had a number of overseas postings. And yeah, I had a, I mean, I mean, a lot of writing this book, I think is, was the process of sort of like unlearning the, um, the attitudes, I would call it sort of like American supremacy that you just imbibe, um, when that's how you grow up. Um, it doesn't, I think anyone who's sort of living overseas in some sort of government capacity like that, you know, whether it's military or foreign service, like that's, that's sort of how you, um, think of things. So I was like, writing the book was like sort of a nostalgia for that time, but also kind of like working out of my system to be like, that's, I, you know, I, I no longer like feel that America is like a beacon in the world as I, you know, might once You're not felt. projecting American power by <laughs> virtue of your posting in Greece or whatever. Yeah, no, I get that. Um, so your father, you were telling me your father quit, resigned from the state department in protests in advance of the Iraq war. Um, was that hard for you guys? I mean, I was in college when it happened, so my, my life was hard for other reasons. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I was just, yeah, I mean, that was just a, a, a strange time um, for for everyone involved. I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, he's like, yeah, I think that's so all. So courageous, that's though. All, that's all like, I have to say. <laughs> I mean, it, it I remember, look, we were talking about this backstage. I was 23 at the time. Um the drumbeat for war in Washington where I was living was so intense. People who objected were silenced so quickly and so harshly. The gears of government were expected to ramp up and all just be in support of this thing. And for to be one of those lonely voices that stood up at the time when there was the maximum pressure and be like, I'm not going to go along with this. It's incredibly brave. And I imagine quite difficult, but like, I don't know, people, the, the, the bummer about these brave stands is I don't think that people get the credit they deserve in hindsight when they were right. Like look at Sinead O'Connor. We're just now being like, Oh yeah, she had a point about the Pope. Well, I, yeah. I mean, I think there's a lot of people now who are like, well, of course the Iraq war was a disaster. And it's like the same people who were like, this seems like a great idea. I mean, there's been, I mean, for that whole era of, you know, American politics and sort of media coverage, there's no accountability for, um, I mean, the war on terror is just, which is, you know, ongoing. There's not, 
Yeah. I mean, I, we were talking about this, like I, that's one of the sort of sub themes in the book. Um, I read a lot about the war on terror years and, you know, not all of it made its way into the book, but I was sort of thinking of it similarly to working in oil and gas above a certain level. Um, it's just, there's certain kind of like mistakes and like crimes that are so big that they are, they're never acknowledged because acknowledging them would mean like accountability. And that's, um, people are very eager to avoid that, especially if you look at oil and gas companies, they're all like, we're now green tech companies. Um, right. <laughs> nothing's wrong. We're fine. We're the energy transition. We're beyond petroleum. Yes. Didn't you hear it? It's literally the name. So did you go into the book intending to use fiction and a novel and these characters in the story as a vehicle to educate people about the energy industry or did that just kind of happen along the way? That definitely um, happened on the way. I, I, I was interested in writing about um, that kind of upbringing and that sort of like, because I think uh, I obviously can't speak for like other people who have lived overseas or, you know, in, in kind of unfamiliar places when they're kids and teenagers. But um, in my case, you know, there was definitely you 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 grow up being told like oh this is such a this is such an enriching experience that you're having and you you know you have so much like insight now because of this experience but then you realize it's like no you're just being an american in like another location it doesn't you know there's still like a huge amount of insularity to that experience and so i was wanted to kind of play with that and think about it um and also i'm just interested in teenage girls and i wanted to talk about a teenage girl who was familiar to me but as i was you know for a while i, I it's like you know, Bunny was there, but I had no kind of justification for her other than that. I, I was just kind of like clowning this teenage girl for no reason. Um, and, and, and sort of the, that kind of like foreign service, like embassy lifestyle. But then as I was reading, because my family had been posted to Yerevan, Armenia in 1997. Um, and so I was, I, you know, I didn't want to write necessarily like directly about that, but I wanted to stay kind of in the zone. And I was, I read a book um, called The Oil and the Glory by the um, former Wall Street Journal journalist, um, Steve Levine. And uh, that was, it's a, an amazing book. And it's about basically like the the rush for Caspian oil reserves after the collapse of the Soviet Union and like specifically Chevron and BP kind of like duking it out. Um, and so when I read that, I was like, oh my God, I, I want to write about this. Um, and And I went kind of too far in that direction for a while. Um, just like writing all these like random weird oil men. And then I realized I needed to like take it back to my teenage girl and figure out a way to kind of weave it in. And then it sort of went from there. Then I suddenly had like a justification for Bunny as a, as a, um, you know, main character of a story. So you have this sort of spectrum of interesting views of, of characters in the book. Like there's literal like oil and gas executives, there's kind of like sort of the parody of sort of the, the super liberal critique of the industry. And there's Bunny, who's sort of this naive person who brings us through all the years of the story. Why did you decide to have her at the center of everything? Um, so actually, when I when my first book came out um, after in the like year or two after, I had a couple of occasions when I was driving to L.A. for some sort of book thing and driving there and back from San Francisco when we lived there. And I started listening to the audio book of the novel Oil um, by Upton Sinclair. They later made, that's what There Will Be Blood is based on, although they have like almost nothing in common. Um, they, it's like, really, I think he used like the first 30 pages and then just like threw away the rest of the book. I option it. That's kind of um, expensive. I mean, you know, I'm sure he had it. They're both, you know, to, it was like a generative work of art that created another work of art, but they have no bearing on each other. Um, and, but so the, the main character of oil, the novel, um, is named bunny. He's a boy. Um, and he starts out as like a young, like a tween or a teenager. And he's like a little oil scion and he follows his father around and watches as he like buys up oil leases. And, and then he meets like a noble socialist, um, who kind of teaches him about, you know, workers and the oil fields. And, and it just sort of follows him for like hundreds of pages. And so then I realized like, he he's kind of, I, I think useful idiot actually has like a literal meaning that I might not be like correctly using, but, but he's kind of a blank slate. Like he just is our guide, um, through at, 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 cause Upton Sinclair had like big messages that he was trying to get through and he really wanted to educate the reader about all of these different systems. So I think that helped me a lot because I, I was like, well, what if bunny, but a teenage girl and, you know, in the kind of, in the neoliberal era and, 
you know, with a teenage girl's like painful insecurity and powers of observation, which the bunny of um, Sinclair's novel like didn't have to quite the same extent. And so I had, it was a balancing act to kind of keep her like in that state of naivete so that we could learn with her and from her, um, which sometimes I think kind of strains credulity that she could be so actually, no, it doesn't. Cause I meet people all the time who are like exactly like her, but, um, and, and myself have been, have been like her, but yes, she, I needed her to, um, I needed her to be a vehicle in that way. She's very fun to follow. I mean, it, the, the challenge that we've had, look, talking about climate change it can be really hard, right? Because it's such a big problem. It's hard to feel hopeful about it. It's hard to feel some sort of agency or help people feel like they still have some agency when things are getting kind of dire. How did you wrestle with those challenges in the book? Um, and the, the desire to sort of educate people about this thing happening around us that we still have some time to impact, um, but is not going great. Well, I think I, I really like gave up on the, I, I don't think fiction is like, I don't, although I just said all that about Upton Sinclair, like educating people through his novel, I don't ultimately think that, I, I think of fiction more as like a, as a documentation project rather than necessarily like a didactic or like educational one. Um, I mean, I think, you know, people talk a lot about like fiction as a vehicle for empathy and like, yes, that in some cases like is true, but I don't think that empathy necessarily like spurs action. Usually it just more is like cathartic. Um, and so I wasn't really like, there were some moments where I'm kind of like, people need to know, you know, like that these oil companies are, they're all connected, man. Um, but, <laughs> but I, I really like pretty early was like, this isn't going to be a novel that's like, because it, I mean, it's functionally erasing the many people who aren't like Bunny. I mean, there are a lot of people who, you know, gestures with some of the characters who are thinking differently than Bunny and actively like resisting um, this state of affairs. But but what I felt like I could bring to the page was my knowledge of like, you know, elite white spaces and sort of white millennial woman, um, head in the sand vibes. And, you know, that it felt like that was something that I could like document, um, in a meaningful way. And that's not necessarily like educational. Um, I mean, <laughs> um, because I don't, you know, I struggled with like, uh, I don't want to, you know, write a novel that's like, it's, it's doomed, but you know, the way oil and gas companies are behaving and the way we are allowing them to behave, like it is, I mean, for people who have already died, like that the, the future is like foreclosed upon them already, you know? So I think it's appropriate to be like, to acknowledge that and, and say, sometimes things like don't have to be hopeful. I, my, the way I kind of justified it to myself sometimes, because I w was like, well, this, there's some like bleak, there's some really like sort of bleak currents in the book is that, you know, you can do like doom on the sheets of paper, but like action in the streets yeah. and, you know, <laughs> can put, can put that on your tote bag. Um, I love that. No, that, that should absolutely, we'll go to brunch and talk about that. Um, what are you reading? Anything you, you like? So I just read a wonderful novel, um, called Enter Ghost by Isabella Hamad, and it's about doing a um, performance of Hamlet in the, um, in Palestine and in the West Bank. And it's a beautiful novel. Um, she also wrote a novel called The Parisian, which is a wonderful novel. I also want, I think these people are in the audience, but um, my book comes out on August 1st and so does um, Eden Lepucky. Her novel is called Time's Mouth and it's amazing. Um, and <laughs> uh, <laughs> yay! And um, Carrie Howley wrote a book. Who is a, a genius? Um, wrote a book called "Bottoms Up and the Devil Laughs" um, about the security state and reality winner that came out a few months ago. And that is a um, really like haunting work of narrative nonfiction. Um, and then about you know, I did like I read so many books for this book and some books that really kind of made me think a lot. And I, you know, I'm not like many people have read them already, but, um, this changes everything, uh, by Naomi Klein is a, is a wonderful book and, um, a book called revolutionary power by Shalonda Baker, who I think now holds a position in the department of energy was really like instructive for thinking about how the energy transition might just end up 
like allowing the same people to kind of profit if we don't fundamentally like change and sort of dismantle the systems that we have. Those were really useful books for me. Thank you all for coming out. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Please uh, buy a book, buy two, buy one for a friend. Um, and thanks again. All right. Thanks, everyone. Uh, we will uh, talk to you later this week. Have a good one. Buy Mobility. You'll love it.